this evening, we're um, actually looking at one verse uh, from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Uh, but I would like to read the entire chapter because it explains the one verse. So I'd like to read 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 31. Usually don't have a text quite this long, but really everything that is mentioned in here will be helpful in our understanding what Paul means and how we can apply this to our lives. So let's begin 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. Paul writes, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example. And they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. You judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Look at the nation Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons, or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he, are we? All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this meat is sacrificed to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake. I mean not your own conscience, but the other man's. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. Again, Paul's point here is that we are to do everything that we do for the glory of God and for the good of others in order not to put a stumbling block in front of others. By the way, I should just mention this verse 23, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. I've heard people interpret that verse to say that 
the law of God is, is defunct. It's, it's something that Christ has fulfilled. I don't have to keep it anymore. Everything is lawful for me to do now. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but that, that is wrong. That's not what he's saying. What he's talking about is food. The Lord certainly has removed the dietary restrictions, and we are free to eat what we will, but not if it destroys a brother or a sister or even puts a stumbling block in front of an unbeliever in coming to the Lord. We need to make sure that what we do at all times is going to minister to others, is going to show love to others, is not going to put a stumbling block in their way from coming to the Lord. So even though we may have liberty in certain areas, we need to be careful we don't use that liberty to, again, stop people or to offend people or to stumble people. We need instead to become all things to all men in order that we may bring them to Christ that they might be saved. Now, again, Paul, as I have mentioned here, is warning in this chapter between, I mean, it's not just that. It's also being divided between the things of the Lord and the things that are contrary to the Lord. Uh, he points out to the Corinthians first all the spiritual blessings that their spiritual fathers had. And he's talking about the nation of Israel. The fact that they were all baptized into Moses, he says, in the cloud and in the sea. The fact that they all ate the same spiritual food, which was the manna that fell from heaven. They all drank the same spiritual drink, which is the water from the rock. And he said that rock was Christ. I don't think literally Christ, but certainly a picture of Christ. Uh, he is the one from whom the living water comes. If we drink, we will live. And yet having all these spiritual privileges, he says with most of them, God was not pleased. As a matter of fact, God destroyed most of these people in the wilderness in various ways, with fiery serpents by the destroyer, by which I think he means the destroying angel that not only you know, passed over Egypt and destroyed all the firstborn, but sometimes was even let loose on the people of God because of their sins. And again, the reason why that happened was because they had so many privileges, spiritual privileges. They had the the Word of God, the oracles of God. They had the promises of God. They had the promises of the Messiah. He was promised to them. And yet, in spite of all the blessings God had given to them, they craved evil things. He says they were idolaters. They committed acts of immorality. They grumbled against the Lord. Now, Paul's point again is that they were counted among the people of God with all these privileges, and yet in the end they were destroyed. Now, why were they destroyed? Is it because eternal security is, is a fiction? It's not true? No. But it's because they didn't trust the Lord. It's because they didn't give their lives to the Lord. It's because they weren't converted by the things God had given to them in order to convert them. Paul's reminding the Corinthians you can be a member of a church. You can have all the spiritual privileges of membership, be baptized, attend worship, participate in the sacraments, and still end up being destroyed because unconverted. So how do you draw the line between those who know the Lord and those who don't? Well, one way, of course, is by taking heed to what Paul says here, listening to this warning. Again, he says, these things happened as an example for us. They were written down for our instruction so that we would learn this lesson, so that we would be careful not to be presumptuous, not to think that we stand so that we fall. Now, how can we do this? Paul actually gives to us several different ways. First, he says, realize that whenever you're tempted, God will always provide a way of escape. Make sure you look for that way. Make sure you take it. Secondly, he says, steer clear of idolatry. You can't be a partaker in the table of the Lord. Come to the Lord's Supper and proclaim that oneness with him, that oneness with one another, the fact that you're uh, cleansed of your sins and nourished upon Christ and be a participant in the table of demons or partake of the world. You can't have Christ and the world. You must be His and His alone. And thirdly, he says you need to make sure that in the way that you live, you do not stumble 
your brothers and sisters. Again, it could get a little bit complicated here, but I think what Paul is saying is simply this, that you have liberty to eat this meat sacrificed to an idol as long as you understand that there is no such thing as an idol. Uh, they're just wooden stone. They're not deities. But if you're eating, stumbles a brother or sister who isn't convinced that these things aren't real, or even an unbeliever to put a stumbling block in your way, if you're eating, stumbles them, if you're eating, causes a brother or sister to sin against their conscience, then you are actually not only causing them to sin, but you're sinning yourself. Now, it may be lawful to eat all things, but when you use your liberty to stumble your neighbor, he says you're no longer living according to love. Now, all of that is to get to this, Paul's conclusion. What is the conclusion to all this? He says, whether then you eat or drink, and again, I think it's referring to the eating and drinking associated with uh, sacrifices, as you just mentioned. Then he says, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. In everything you do, do everything out of love for the Lord, for the souls of men, for the brethren. Make sure that you love in all these things. Don't dishonor God or offend Him. Don't stumble somebody, keep them from coming to Christ. Don't stumble your brothers or your sisters, causing them to sin. This, I believe, is a definition of a life that is totally consecrated to God. This is how he calls us to live. Now, that's just the introduction. I wanna, what I want us to do is this evening look at three things, and, and these all will come back into it. Let's consider these three, three things. The Lord, first of all, wants all of you. He wants your whole life. He wants a life of total consecration to him. Secondly, let's consider why he wants your whole life and not just part of it. And then thirdly, how you can give him more of your life. So first of all, understand the Lord wants all of your life. He wants your whole life. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I think we have to admit that consecration, and that's what I'm talking about here, that's what I mean by total consecration, setting yourself apart to the Lord. Total consecration is something that is seriously lacking in the church today. It's something that perhaps we struggle with as well. There are so many people who profess to know and to love the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet live their Christianity from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock, perhaps on Sundays, but live the rest of their lives for themselves. They promised to give their whole lives to the Lord when, when they came to Him, but they have difficulty letting go. They have difficulty perhaps even spending the whole day with the Lord, as the Lord calls us to in the fourth commandment. Now we need to ask ourselves the question, can we honestly say that we love the Lord and are looking forward to spending an eternity with God if we have difficulty even spending one day a week with Him? I do think that the Sabbath, uh, the fourth commandment, which, which calls us to remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy, which I do believe, according to the New Testament Scripture, still applies to us today, it, it's sort of a, a spiritual thermometer it helps us to check and to gauge where we are with regard to our hearts. Am I willing to give this day to the Lord as He calls me to? Do I enjoy spending the day with Him? And do I do that because I love Him? Or do I see it rather as like an, an inconvenience? You know, uh, I wish I, this day would get over so I can get back to the things I really love. You know, I can play my sports or I can... I can uh, you know, watch movies or whatever it is I enjoy doing, go to the theaters. Uh, is this a drag? Is this day a drag or is this day a blessing? You realize that the answer to that question says a lot about our hearts. You know, again, we say we love the Lord and we say that we want to spend eternity with Him. We can't wait to get to heaven to be with Him. And yet, when we have a picture, that, that picture God gives to us of heaven on earth, a day where we really are doing what we're going to be doing throughout eternity, which is worshiping the Lord. Do we look forward to this day? 
Do we love this day? And do we spend this time with the Lord? Well, we need to stop and evaluate if we don't. Because if we don't, then do we really love him? Or are we doing this because we really don't want the alternative? We don't want to go to hell. And that's why we do it. Now, again, if we have trouble spending a day with God, what about everything else that he requires of us? Because what, what does he require? Well, he requires that every part of our lives be holy to him and set apart to him. He, he tells us that everything we do, we are to do for the glory of God. In our meditation, we saw that we are to present ourselves as living sacrifices to God. Now, listen to what Jesus says also, and again, in some very familiar verses. If anyone wishes to come after me, in other words, if you wish to be saved, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Then Jesus goes on to say in Luke 14, 27, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now again, how do we conceive of this? Is this just picking the cross up when it's convenient and dropping it when it's convenient? Or is this picking it up and carrying it continually, denying ourselves continually, dying to ourselves continually, and following the Lord. If we can't deny ourselves long enough even to spend one day with Him, how are we going to be able to give Him our whole lives? And you see, this is the point. God calls us to give ourselves wholly to Him. The Lord wants all of you. He wants all your time. He wants all your strength. He wants all your gifts to be used for his glory. He wants all your resources. Jesus says, unless you're willing to give up all your possessions, you cannot fall, be my disciple. He wants your whole heart, your mind, and your soul. The Lord wants everything that you have, everything that he has given to you. He wants you to devote to him. So the Lord wants it all. Now, secondly, why does the Lord want it all? I mean, is that fair for him to ask? Well, first of all, it belongs to him, doesn't it? Everything you are, everything you have, everything you ever will have belongs to him. He made you, he gave you everything, and it's only right that you be willing to give it back to him. Remember what stewardship means. We are only stewards over everything God has given to us. And one day we're going to be called account to, uh, to give account of our stewardship to make sure that we are doing these things for his glory, or at least what we've done with them will be examined. And again, on that day, there's going to be worthless things. There's going to be good things. No one's going to live a perfect life. But as, as best as we possibly can, we are to use what God has given to us for his glory. Secondly, we are to give ourselves wholly to him because he redeemed you. Remember, you fell away from him in Adam. And remember, God sent his son in order to redeem you. He gave his life for this single purpose, that we would stop living for ourselves and begin living for him. He came to reverse the rebellion that we fell into so that we would stop rebelling against the Lord and begin following him the way he originally made us to do. So he reverses the effects of the fall and makes us obedient servants. This is why he sent Christ into the world. Why should we give ourselves to him? Because as Christ gave himself wholly to us, the Lord did that, he gave that so that we would do the same and give ourselves wholly to him. Thirdly, it's the only right thing to do in light of the fact that we're creatures and God is the creator. Not only because, again, of the things he's, he's done, that he's made us and redeemed us, but because he is God, and being God, he deserves this. He deserves much more than we could possibly ever give him if we gave him everything we had for the rest of our lives. He's worthy of far more than that. But that's the least that we can give him, the very least that we can do for who he is. Now, fourthly, we should give ourselves wholly to him because uh, this is the means by which he has chosen to bring blessing to other people. It is through us. 
we have to give ourselves to him in order for this to take place. Now, if we give ourselves to him, not only will it glorify him and answer the reason why he actually made us and saved us, but we will become a blessing to other people. And as long as we live for ourselves, uh, others are not going to be reached with the gospel of Christ. Others are not going to receive the blessings that God actually offers all men in the gospel. But if we give ourselves to this work, if we give ourselves unreservedly to God, those people will be reached. There will be people who are saved through our efforts. Again, not because it's us, but because God is willing to use us. There are souls that will not have to spend an eternity in hell because we were willing to bring the gospel to them. If only one soul is saved through our collected efforts throughout our entire lives, that alone would be worth it. I don't know if you remember that quote from Spurgeon, but I had to look it up again and read it for you this evening because I think it is, it's so powerful and it reminds us just how important it is, how each soul is important. Spurgeon wrote this, if there existed only one man or woman who did not love the Savior, and if that person lived among the wilds of Siberia, and if it were necessary that all the millions of believers on the face of the earth should journey there, and every one of them plead with him to come to Jesus before he could be converted, it would be well worth all the zeal, labor, and expense if we had to preach to thousands year after year and never rescued but one soul, that one soul would be full reward for all our labor. For a soul is of countless price. I don't know if we look at it in that way, but that's the way we ought to look at it. Souls are precious. I mean, the souls even of God's enemies, even those who are going to hate you and spite you and despise you, make fun of you, uh, maybe do nasty things to you, maybe they won't. But even so, the possibility of saving them, the hope that they might be redeemed, is worth whatever abuse you might receive from them. So why should we give ourselves to the Lord? Because if we don't give ourselves to the Lord, souls won't be saved, and every soul is precious. Well, fifthly, we should give ourselves to the Lord because this is God's way of actually bringing his blessings down to us because when we don't do what the Lord calls us to do, and we don't give ourselves to him the way that we should, and we are his children, then the Lord will withhold his blessings from us, and he will give us discipline instead. But if we will actually serve him, the Lord will give to us. If we give our time to him, I believe the Lord will actually give us additional strength and energy to make better use of the time we have remaining. I don't know if you've ever discovered that, but, but it is true. You say, you know, I don't, I don't have time to do this. I have so much I have to do. I, I don't have time to, to, to set aside and to go minister to this person's need. And then you say, oh, okay, well, I'm going to go and minister to this person's needs. And you do it, and you spend more time than you know you have, and then you come back to what you had to do before. And you say, how am I going to get all this done? And you begin to work on it, and amazingly, it all gets done, gets done better, gets done more quickly because the Lord is in it, because the Lord is blessing what you're doing. If you're willing to give your time to the Lord, he will make up for it in other ways. If you give your gifts to the Lord and minister to others with those gifts, you're not going to lack, you're not going to, um, well, get worn out because God will give you greater strength, he'll give you greater, greater energy. If you give your resources to serve the Lord, God will give back to you as he promises in his word. You can't outgive him. Not to mention the fact that when you do these things, you are storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So why should you give yourself wholly to the Lord? Because you can't outgive the Lord. Whatever you devote to him, the Lord will make up and he will give you even more. So why is it that some were able to accomplish such great things in the name of the Lord and we kind of look at our own resources and say, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to do that. It's because as they gave, the Lord gave back and he continued to give them strength and made them more and more fruitful until they reached that kind of a stage 
for willing to give ourselves to the Lord, God will give back to us and he will bless us. So the Lord calls us to give ourselves wholly to him. And we've seen many of the reasons why he has called us to do that again because of all the blessings that will accrue, not only to honor him, to advance his cause, but souls will be saved and you will be blessed. Finally, we need to ask the question, how? How can you do this? How can you give yourself more to the Lord? Well, the only reason why we don't give ourselves more than we do now is again because of a lack of desire. You have to love the Lord in order to give yourself to Him as He calls you to. And the more you love the Lord, the more you will give yourself to Him. You're not going to be able to do it apart from that. So how can you love Him more? Again, it all comes down to that, doesn't it? Love. How, how can I love the Lord more strongly so that I can give myself more to Him? Well, we saw this morning that by meditating on His love for you, that's one way you can strengthen it, especially as we come to the table and remember what the Father gave us in the Son, what the Son did for our salvation. That certainly should move us to give ourselves more to Him. Uh, through all the means of grace that the Lord gives to us to build ourselves up in the Holy Spirit, as the Lord gives you more love and as you give yourself more to Him, then you will continue to grow in love. Uh, second, I believe, and this is something we looked at a little while ago, but something we have to be willing to do if we are to give ourselves wholly to the Lord, and perhaps this is one of the major obstacles, you have to be willing to do what God calls you to do, no matter what kind of persecution or suffering might come your way. Uh, that's one of the things I think that stops us most of the time. That and the fact that we want to do something more. You know, we want to do this pleasure, that pleasure, this fun, that fun. We talked about this morning how in doing that, we're being disloyal to Jesus who calls us to do certain things. But if we devote ourselves instead to just pleasure for ourselves, we're not doing what the king is telling us to do. We're being disloyal but the other reason why we don't do it is because we know if we do, it's not going to be pleasant. Um, and yet, the Bible tells us it should be pleasant. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that, that even if we are persecuted, even if we suffer, that that should be a reason for us to rejoice and not, not be something we should try to avoid. Uh, Paul gloried in the fact that he bore in his own body the, well, the scars that were meant for Christ. He preached the gospel. They hated him for it. They beat him for it. He gives a whole catalog of things they did to him in 2 Corinthians. And instead of saying, you know, why did I ever follow the Lord? Oh, I've been nothing but, but been beaten up this whole time. It's just been miserable. You know, he didn't say that. Instead, he said, I glory in the fact that I can stand in Christ's place and take the abuse that is meant for him. That should be a reason for us to rejoice, although oftentimes we look at it the opposite way. We need to remember that it is a blessing to be persecuted in Jesus' place. Jesus says in Matthew 5.10, the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He goes on to talk about, blessed are you when people mistreat you and say all manner of things falsely against you on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. So by doing God's will, or I should say in order to give yourself more fully to the Lord, you have to be willing to be persecuted. You have to be willing to risk suffering and to remember at the same time that even if you are persecuted, even if you do suffer, it is a great blessing and not a curse. And finally, in order to give yourselves to the Lord fully, and this, this is not so much motivational as it is just directional, you need to know how to do that. You need to know how it is God has called you to live. And you need to determine that that is the way that you're actually going to live. Oh, that life of non-compromise, that life of 
resisting temptation and sin. You, you, you need to determine that you're going to do the things that we've already seen uh, Paul exhort the Corinthians earlier in this chapter. That you're not going to eat at the table in the, of the Lord and the table of, of uh, demons or the table of the world. That when you are tempted, you are going to seek a way out. You're going to seek for that way of escape he's given you. And you're not going to allow yourself to stumble your brothers and your sisters in the Lord but you're going to encourage them by your example to live a godly life. Now, really, I think that almost encapsulates everything that God wants us to do as his children, how he wants us to live. You need to know what he calls you to do, and you need to determine that that is, in fact, what you are going to do. Now, if you don't do that, then every step along the way these betrayals of Christ, this disloyalty to Christ is going to quench the Spirit of God. You know, we can use the means, we can meditate on the love of Christ, we can think about the benefits to ourselves and to others, we can think about all these things that would motivate us, but as long as we're compromising, it's still going to weaken us to the point where we're not going to be able to give ourselves to the Lord as fully as we should. Compromise quenches the Spirit. Compromise saps your strength. But living according to God's will, living according to his word will build you up in Christ. Uh, there, you know, there's a method, there's a, there's a method, of course, or a reason why the Lord calls us to live the life he calls us to live. He does want us to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus lived according to God's will. He lived strictly according to the commandments. Jesus, his meat and drink was to do the will of his Father. Now, Jesus did that not only to save your life, but he did that to leave you an example to follow. Jesus obeyed the commandments so that you might follow his example in obeying the commandments. Jesus gave you his spirit so that you would want to do that, so that you would have the same attitude that he had toward the commandments, and still does, of course, even in heaven as a man, and that is your, that your meat and drink might be to do the will of God. So as we live and submit to what the Spirit of God is seeking to do in us, as we live according to the will of God, as we submit ourselves to the commandments in the way that our Lord Jesus Christ did, then we're going to be growing into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ rather than through our betrayal growing out of his likeness. We need to determine to obey the commandments because it's only by doing this that we will preserve what we have of the Spirit's influence and cause it to grow and be transformed more and more into the image of Christ. Now again, um, that's a large subject, growing into the image of Christ, and yet it's summarized by the ten words of Scripture, the ten commandments, or what are called by the Jews the ten words. And that's what I want us to really look at for the next few Lord's Day evenings, is just be reminded what those commandments actually call us to do, and be encouraged to do them. Because every time we step out of God's will and we break those commandments, as we saw this morning, we're betraying. Jesus Christ. But each time we keep them, each time we do them, we're actually growing in strength and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So it is important that we keep those commandments. We don't keep them to be saved. Again, we are saved and we're given the strength to keep them by the Lord. But keeping them or not keeping them has a lot to do with our personal sanctification, which is our growth into the image of Christ. If we are going to be able to give ourselves wholly to him, we have to purpose to keep those commandments. So we'll, as I said, we'll begin looking at that next Lord's Day evening, or at least the commandments in particular. But for tonight, remember these things. God calls you to complete cons consecration. He wants you to give yourself wholly to him, not just a part of you, not just a portion of your time, your resources, and so forth. He wants all of you, all your strength, all your gifts, all your resources. He wants the whole person. He wants you because he made you. 
He wants you because that's what you owe him by virtue of creation. That's what you owe him by virtue of redemption. That's the reason why he redeemed you. And so that you might be a blessing to others as well as being blessed yourself. Now again, remember what God calls you to do. All of what he calls you to do is good for you. It is the best thing for you. It is the best thing for others. It is that which glorifies him the most. It is love. That's what he wants. And so how can we object to that? Well, we really can't, unless, of course, we do not love the Lord. And so begin to take inventory of your life with regard to the things we've looked at, and more particularly, with regard to God's commandments as we begin to look at these things. Where are you, are you actually succeeding in doing the things the Lord calls you to do? Well, where you see that you're succeeding, pray that God would give to you more grace to do even better. Uh, look for those areas in which you're failing, failing to resist temptation, failing uh, to, uh, well, by compromising with the world, uh, failing by, by stumbling unbelievers by your lifestyle or even stumbling believers in the household of God. Uh, find those areas and repent of the things you see that you're doing. Turn around from those things and begin to do what the Lord has called you to do. But for those of you who haven't yet actually given yourself to the Lord, do remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. As he says further in Matthew chapter 16, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The Lord says, if you're going to follow him, pick up your cross and follow after him. We've seen he wants all of you. If you're not willing to do that, realize the Lord says you will lose your life. If you're not willing to give your life to him, you will lose your life. If you give your life to him, you will gain it. So don't hold on to your life, but give it to the Lord. Holding on to your life here simply means I'm going to do what I want to do. I am not going to love the way God calls me to love. I am going to live for my own pleasure, my own happiness, or at least what I think is going to bring me happiness. I'm going to do things my way. Jesus says if you do that, you forfeit life. But if you will, in fact, submit to him and trust him, pick up your cross and follow him and do things his way, you will gain your life. You'll actually find it is a far better way to live than any way that you might choose to live otherwise. He will give you eternal life, which begins here as a quality of life, but as you know, extends forever in heaven and gets amplified even more there. So don't take another step toward hell. But turn to the Lord in faith if you have not trusted in Him and receive His gift of eternal life. And then do what He tells you. Pick up your cross and follow after Him. Give Him all that you have. And the Lord will bless you in ways that you couldn't even imagine. It is truly the path to happiness. Well, may the Lord help all of us to give ourselves to him as we're faced with choices either to obey him or not. As we've seen this morning, let's not betray him. But let's give ourselves fully to him for his glory and his honor, and you will be blessed. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us do that.